Welcome to Australian Hiker, your online hiking resource. We're your hosts, Tim and Jill Savage. This is episode 155 of the Australian Hiker podcast. Over the past three years, Australian Hiker has attended the annual Outdoor Retailer Australia show. This show is a chance for Australia's outdoor wholesalers and manufacturers to showcase their new and existing products to Australia's outdoor retailers and allied media, and that includes Australian Hiker. Due to the pandemic, the show was cancelled in 2020, but rather than let the opportunity pass, we managed to catch up with a small number of suppliers, just for an update to see how things are going. In today's episode, we'll be catching up with two suppliers. Now, there's been a couple of differences from the last three years that we've done this series of interviews. Typically, we had a fairly short period of time to catch up with the manufacturers and suppliers, Um, whereas this year, um, I ended up talking to each of the suppliers for quite an extended period, uh, both before and after the formal interview. Um, We had some quite in-depth conversations about what was going on with the industry, Uh, and I was even privy to some new release product, which I can't talk about at the moment, but I'm certainly looking forward to once it actually hits the market. One thing we did find with these interviews is we had a bit more opportunity to talk a bit more about the technical aspects of the gear. So one of the interviews in today in particular, we spent quite a bit of time talking about technical things to relate to the product we talk about and it makes sense uh, and it explains the reasoning for this product coming onto the market and it's it's quite a it's an it's an educational opportunity just as much as anything else the other thing that we did that was a bit different this year is to talk to the suppliers about how they saw 2020 shaping up in the first half of the year Between the fires and the pandemic, there's been quite an impact on the outdoor industry, both on the wholesalers, the retailers, and us as hikers. Uh, And it's, it's interesting to hear their take on how they saw things or how they've seen things go over the first half of 2020. One final comment I'd make before we do start listening to the interviews is that the outdoor industry t- seems to be reasonably cyclical, where there'll be a lot of new product come to the market in some years, and then in other years, it's fairly light on. And in this case, um, we actually had a number of suppliers say to us that some new product, which they were due to release, they've actually held off to allow some of the retail stores to clear some pre-existing stock, which hasn't had an opportunity to move with a number of of bricks and mortar stores being closed. So there is some new and exciting product coming to the market over the next four to six, eight months. Uh, And there'll certainly be quite a lot of new product coming to the market uh, in the next 12 to 18 months. So it's uh, it's interesting to see what is coming to the market this year. And as I said, there's some really good stuff what's worthwhile looking forward to, particularly in the early part of 2021. We hope you enjoy. Okay, so now we're talking to Alex Kingston from Velovita and Timo Sports, uh, and they're the suppliers of a number of well-known products, including Deuter, Lecky and Cliff, uh, and we're going to talk to Alex about those products today. So, Alex, thank you for taking the time. Thanks for having me. Nice to be okay, so let's start off with Lecky. Now, I think a lot of people may be aware of what Lecky are, but what is Lecky and what do they do? Uh, so, Lecky are the biggest um, pole manufacturer in the world. So, uh, they make uh, walking poles and trekking poles uh, and ski poles. Um, for, for every market in the world. So 
Um, they're they're very big in in ski. So if you were in the northern hemisphere and, and did a lot of skiing, you'd you'd know about them. But down here, we tend to use a lot more of their their walking and trekking poles. I must must admit, I didn't really think about ski poles, but it makes sense, yeah. I suppose. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, if if you watch the Olympic cross country ski champions, they'll all be using wacky poles, as will the you know downhill champions as well. Okay, so what's what's new for Lecky, and or what's what what sort of direction is Lecky heading these days? Yeah, so Lecky's had um, trekking poles in the market for for quite some time, and I guess uh, they're they're still ticking along very well with a lot of um, names like the Makalu and, and things that we've had for quite a while. Um, but the new parts of the market is the trail running, which is which has had amazing growth in the last number of years, uh, and Lecky's brought out a new intermediary range uh, called the cross trail uh, which bridges the gap between a, a full trail running pole and a trekking pole so we're looking at a folding pole carbon um, that's uh, lightweight um, has a lot of the trail running features with the grips um, and and enables you to move fast with the pole um, but a little bit stronger and has a few more of the features of the trekking poles um, to make it a bit more comfortable if you're not actually uh, trying to run in a race. So what, actually on that on that topic then, what's what's the difference between a, a trail running pole and a, and a trekking pole? I mean, I, I've seen them, but you know, is there, are they constructed differently or is, what, what, what is the difference? So in construction, you're probably looking fairly similar. Um, so you can have a folding trekking pole, a folding... Uh, running pole. Um, the top end running poles are all fixed length to be even lighter. Um, the different diameters of the poles uh, makes a difference. So um, the trekking poles are going to have a slightly wider diameter to make them a little bit stronger. The full running poles are going to be a little bit narrower and thinner to lighten them up a little bit. Um, the tip of the pole, uh, you know, a trekking pole is going to have a bigger basket and a bigger area so that when you're dealing with mud and things like that, it's got some purchase. Whereas the the lighter running poles are going to have a much smaller tip that's designed not to get caught in things. Um, the running poles are going to have a much thinner handle and a very small um, top of the handle, um, whereas all the trekking poles are going to have a bigger, um, rounder, almost a ball on the top of the um, handle to enable you to put your hand on top of that and get some purchase off it as you're, you know, climbing some stairs or, or coming down something steep. Um, and then the, the handles that you get on the trekking poles, they'll have a standard um, you know, strap that just goes around your wrist, um, whereas the, the running poles will have uh, more of a glove that clips into the, into the pole itself and enables the pole to pivot off the space between your thumb and your first finger um, so you can get some um, – the pole flicks a bit easier when you're, when you're trying to get it to move. It'll, it'll pivot off that point a bit easier. I must admit, I, uh, I I saw it in some of the uh, the images that you sent me, and I thought they look really, really, really nice. So it sort of looks like a a good, comf comfortable strap rather than the the traditional band that most of the poles tend to tend to use for hiking. Yeah, and on the the top end running poles, they're also designed that there's a clip you you can just pop the pole straight off your hand anytime you need to. So if you decide you you want to put it away, you can unclip it and fold it up really quickly and put it away. Um, but maybe leave the, the grip on your hands and then when you get through the section that you might be trying to get through or once you've had your coffee, you can, um, you know, clip it all back up again and keep going. Okay. So hiking-wise, have they got any new and new and new butte poles coming out in the, in the next uh, next year or so? Um, as for trekking, a pole range is, is fairly, um, fairly standard and keeps just – ticking along uh just a few name changes and and, and color changes um but on the whole um they're kind of uh, continuing on a few um updates to the way the the folding poles um clip and a few slight adjustments to make sure that they're a little bit stronger and, and a bit um uh get, get rid of any issues that might have been there in the past but um on the whole um we have very good quality, and um, there's not a lot changing in the in the straight trekking poles. Um, but we are seeing a growth in the in the higher end trekking poles for us. Yeah. Uh, so up in your um, your your microvario carbon, which is your your higher end folding and adjustable uh, trekking pole, um, uh, we have also noticed uh, in Australia 
and it is a worldwide trend as well, that the, the anti-shock, which was a, a big thing a few years ago, um, a lot of people have moved away from wanting anti-shock and they're going just to a standard pole because of weight. Um, the weight consideration of the anti-shock does add um, a fair amount of weight to a pole, so they're, they're wanting to get away from that and just go to a straight standard pole. I must admit, I, I never ever tried a pair of anti-shock poles. I, I, I sort of stayed with the, the, the simpler, uh, less moving parts, lighter weight sort of poles. Um, yeah. Uh, and, I mean, I think the idea looked good, but it, just, it was just something I never got into. So, uh, mm. Yeah, I, I have used them, but uh, and they, they, they can be nice. But, yeah, like I say, the, a lot of people are going for the weight, uh, the weight advantage these days. Yeah. Okay, uh, now moving on to Deuter. Deuter's well-known pack company, and I'm pretty sure that's all they do. They don't make other products, do they? Uh, so they do uh, They do a range of sleeping bags, okay. in both down and synthetic, that we currently don't um, support in the Australian market. Um, but uh, the bulk of what they do and, and their history has been in um, is in backpacks, yes. Right. Um, and what's what's new for Deuter in the, in the coming season? Uh, so in the coming season, um, we've got some uh, updates to our AC Light series uh, and to the Futura series. So uh, a number of updates. Um, the, the biggest one that, that uh, I think Doit is most excited about is uh, PFC free. So in fact, all our backpack range is now PFC free uh, and um, all our fabrics are now blue sign as well in the main portions of the backpacks and that's that's saying it's environmentally friendly is it or it is saying it's environmentally friendly um Deuter is, is very conscious of the environment um i think uh in europe they're a little bit uh, more conscious than uh, australia might be at the moment but um and, and in their purchasing decisions a lot of um, europeans will will make a decision on on the sustainability and environmental credentials of the company um and and Deuter is very aware of that um so it, it, it does make a big difference. So um, 12% less output in greenhouse gases um, has been achieved by changing the fabrics around right. in the way they have uh, and obviously removing the PFC, which uh, which builds up in the environment. So we've been trying to get rid of that for quite some time. Uh, and, um, yeah, 50% of the yarn used in the raw materials for the Futura series is, is, um, is recycled fabrics. Yeah, yeah, it's it, it's interesting actually. It's sort of uh, we 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 did an episode on how, being environmentally friendly in the uh, in the hiking industry, and, and it is hard sometimes. You, uh, you know, until a few years ago, most companies weren't dealing with uh, recycled products, or uh, there were just new materials all the way through the whole system. Um, and it's it's good to see the industry moving towards that that environmentally friendly stance. Yeah, absolutely, and it's not um, it's not an easy task. It's taken them uh, the first PFC free um, packs came out probably four or more years ago, and it's taken quite a while to get to the point where every fabric that they use can be um, to that to that PFC free. There were there were parts of harnesses and and things that um, they just couldn't get a good quality uh, replacement for, but Working with the um, the yarn manufacturers and um, the different companies they work with to get the raw materials, they've managed to get to the point where they now have that ability. And I think you'll see a lot of other manufacturers following suit pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, and they, so, so it's more an update on the materials rather than new models of packs uh, with Toyota uh, at the moment? Yeah, so there's been some redesigns in the in the Futura series in the top end. Uh, the Futura Vario, which was our adjustable um, top end um, Futura pack, has now changed to an Air Trek um, and, a, and a few changes within the harness to help it fit a bit better and have better um, uh, breathability and better comfort. Um, so that's uh, that'll and all these packs will be out uh, next uh, February March. We'll be landing okay. in Australia. Yeah. It seems it seems to be the the case. It sort of uh, uh, meets the uh, in in time for the American the, the main American hiking market and uh, get through Christmas and um, all all of a sudden all these new products come onto the market. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, the the other pack the uh, the other part of the market that is new uh, about to be released 
but has been delayed due to current situations, uh, is the Movo, our, our rolling luggage. Yep. So our Helion um, packs, which have been in the market for uh, quite some time and are very well known and, and, and very well um, received, um, are being replaced with a brand new range of um, Movo wheeling bags. So there's uh, a duffel style bag with two wheels and a, a more luggage style bag with four wheels. Um, and they should be landing in towards the end of the year. That'll, that'll be interesting to have a look at. We've got uh, our two rolling bags, which are our travel bags, are, are Deuters, so, and we've had them for a number of years, and they've, they've been yep. really reliable and, and done a really good job. So, uh, Yeah, yeah. So without a doubt they're a Helion because it's been out there forever. Yep. Um, yep. So, yeah, there's options with harnesses and there's options without harnesses as well, so depending what you what you need, whether you want a backpack uh, version that wheels as well or whether you need just a wheeling bag. Yeah, yep. yep. Um, and as you say, unfortunately, there's probably not of not probably not much airports use use at the moment for a lot of people. At least, at least, at least uh, away from the uh, uh, Australia, and even there, we we've, the planes aren't flying too much at the moment. So, no, not too much. So yeah, so we thought we'd delay it a little while before we get the stock in, um, but uh, they are due out at the end of the year or early next year at the latest. So um, we're pretty excited about them once they get here, and hopefully we can all fly around using them soon. Okay, now moving on to cliffs. Now, everyone, I think everybody knows cliff bars, and and if you if you haven't, I think people have probably only just started hiking because they're they're one of the mainstays of the uh, of the hiking and outdoor market. So, um, what's new new in the cliff range of of bars and products? Uh, So we do. uh, So nut butter has been out for a little while, and that's our our newer bar. Uh, that's out in the market. That's a higher energy bar using using nut butter uh, inside the bar to to give you a higher energy rating. Um, uh, so they're they're quite a rich bar, but um, very good for for giving you that that burst of energy when you need it. Um, we've uh, obviously got our standard range of, of flavors that that run through, and there's there's quite a choice there now. Um, and then coming out. Uh, Middle of the next half of the year, so in about in about three months, we'll get the Builders Bars. Uh, so the Builders Bars are our protein bar that's been out in the US for for a while, and we've um, managed to get approval. For the biggest issue with with Cliff, uh, their range is quite large, but we do need um, food health safety approvals for everything that comes into Australia. Yep. Um, so we've managed to get the approvals on the the Builders Bars. So we'll have. Um, uh, three flavours of protein bar coming out um, later in the year, which will be quite exciting. That'll be good. I must admit, I, it, it's always hard to, to try and get protein when you're on the trail, and you, know, you can do it in the form of jerky and and some of the uh, the meat based product. But you know, trying to get something that's that's a bit different in a, in a bar bar format, which is often what you get in the gyms, is probably not a bad way to go. Yeah, it can be a good option for you. So, yeah, definitely. Um, Definitely excited to see that come out and change some things up. Uh, and then we've also got a bit of um, packaging changes coming through, uh, limited edition packaging. Uh, so, so Cliff is um, uh, organic. Uh, they're also very conscious of um, political issues around the world and um, supporting different things. So um, one of the ones that's out at the moment is supporting what they call second responders in the U.S., um, so obviously first responders are the firefighters that might go in to fight the bushfire and second responders is the, the second wave that come in to help everyone rebuild. So yep. um, in the US at the moment, they're, they're putting money from um, certain bars that have that fly, that, that packaging um, and putting money towards second responders. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of um, athletes that are getting their own packaging as well on different bars that will start coming out throughout the rest of the year. I must admit, I um uh, the the nut butter bars have been out for I think about two years now in Australia. Uh, uh, maybe maybe a year actually. Okay, a year. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I I I I am a big fan of them. I, I love that nut butter. Uh, uh, of all there's of, of all the three varieties that 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 are at least readily accessible. The uh, the chocolate, the hazelnut, and the uh, now what's the third one? I'm trying to think. Uh, um, peanut butter. Peanut butter. That's right. Yeah. Peanut butter. Peanut uh, butter. Yeah. No, I, 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 I do actually uh, tend to rotate those three bars, and that's that's pretty much replaced the the stock standard Cliff bars as being my my bars of choice now. Yeah. Um, okay. So, 
The other product that Cliff produces as well is the shot blocks. And I think for a lot of people, these have often been associated with cycling and running races. But from my perspective as a long distance hiker, this is something that I do carry with me all the time. So how are the, the shot block range going? Are they they're, they're still the same or they, have there been any changes in those ranges at all? Yeah, so the shop blocks are doing really well. We're getting good growth in them. I think people are starting to find them and, and realise how good they are. Um, they also come across a bit like a, a bit of a lolly, but um, that you don't have to eat the whole packet at once like you would with a with a gel. Um, so you can split it out and have a little bit at a time and spread that out over, over your activity. So, you know, where, if you were in a race, then you might be taking them quite quickly. But if, if you were hiking, for instance, for the day, you might take them, you know, every couple of hours um, just to have a little bit coming and going. Um, they also have uh, versions with... Uh, caffeine, if that's if that's what you need, uh, and with extra um, magnesium to help you to help you with all the um, electrolyte needs that you might have as well. I must admit, from my perspective, you know, I, I do use them on my long distance hikes, and I find that you know, rather than eating, sometimes you just get sick of of dried fruit or even the, even the the bars, and you just want want a bit of energy. And the and the uh, the, the the blocks and the chews are, are definitely a, a good way to do that. So they. They sort of form yeah. a, a part of my my dietary needs on any long distance hike. Okay, so we've been talking to Alex Kingston from Velovita TMO Sports, who, as we said, are the importers and and distributors of Lecky, Deuter, and Cliff. Um, thanks very much for taking your time. Thanks very much for having me. So that was our interview with Alex Kingston from Velo Vita TMO, uh, and they're the, they are the importers of Lecky, Deuter, and Cliff, uh, and they also do a number of other products uh, in the cycling industry as well. So they're well known for that. So, um, so if you're into cycling, you may have come across a number of the products that they deal with. Now. There are a number of things that surprised me from that episode. Um, you know, talking about the fact that Lecky was the biggest pole manufacturer in the world, and you know they are talking about ski poles, and they're saying they pretty much dominate the northern hemisphere in that respect. Uh, and as Alex said, he normally, from an Australian perspective, they really are just dealing with the tracking poles. Lecky is one of the the well known tracking pole manufacturers, uh, and they have uh, certainly. They're probably best known for the high-end tracking poles. So they, they put a lot of detail. They're a very attractive pole. They have a lot of features. Um, uh, and they've got a, you know, they don't really do cheap and nasty poles. Mm. Um, uh, and, you know, and, they, and I think it's one of the things with tracking poles. Uh, if you're going to go for the poles, go for something that's comfortable and durable. Uh, my original pair which I still have and still occasionally use, is um, now going on eight years old and they're still quite happy and cheery. Uh, and I now own three pairs of, of tracking poles all up. I, I only own one and a half pairs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, the, it was a little bit of an accident with... <laughs> with the other half. Yeah, that's right. So I think probably the biggest learning experience for me is, you know, Alex was mentioning that the... One of the biggest upswings has been trail running, and certainly, trail running has become more and more popular. And it's it, there has been a large uptake in the last sort of five years or so, where people are getting away from running around the streets to actually running out bush. And this is something that's taking off in Australia just as much as it is over in, in Europe or the US. Um, and he mentioned that there was a new cross trail uh, carbon folding pole that was due for release. Um, and um, uh, I, I always am on the lookout for lightweight poles. Um, I have never broken a tracking pole at all in the in the sort of just over eight years that I've been using them. Um, I've come really close. I had the first time I ever used tracking poles was in Bhutan in 2012, uh, and for some strange reason, they decided to line the very steep, slippery roadway with with round, shiny uh, uh, river stones. Uh, and I, I managed to almost put a 45-degree angle on the poles that I had, and they came back into shape quite well. Um, but I, it wouldn't have surprised me if I didn't snap it. I think for me, you know, there were, Alex was saying that the difference between 
a running tracking pole and a hiking tracking pole is that the hiking poles tend to be a bit more durable, slightly heavier, and they tend to have a bit more robust um, uh, hand grip. And I, I had a thought about how I actually use tracking poles um, myself and the round knob, for want of a better term, on the end of the uh, the tracking poles. You know, he talks about people that put their hands on top of that. I've never actually done that. In the no, I don't do that them. either. Uh, <laughs> I'm wondering time, why now, but, you know. <laughs> the only time I tend to use that round bit on the top of the poles is when I'm actually – bending over, resting my my neck on them, uh, or resting my chin on them. Uh, just I don't think I've ever done that either, Tim. <laughs> uh, so I don't I, think many people have done no, that. No, you know, it's, probably, it's probably not. It's probably just me. But I think it's one of those things where I'm, I'm going to be keen to hopefully do some reviews of the running style tracking poles this year because I think for me um, – I use them for stability more than anything else, uh, and it, 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 it's a way of me focusing what I'm doing, particularly on the longer tracks, uh, and I think I can probably get away with the, uh, the running tracking poles, save a bit of weight, uh, and I think they will do what I need them to do. Yeah, I think that's the attraction for me too, the, a little bit more lightweight and, and perhaps possibly even pack away a little bit better than um, uh, some of the other poles and... Um, you know, it may be because of that easier to access and get out of your, your side pockets as well. The other thing I'd mention through here is that um, the uh, lucky poles, at least some of the running poles, have a um, uh, a shark flare mesh strap or flame flame mesh strap, and this is almost like it looks like a, a little small glove. It's a weird, uh, weird looking thing. Yeah. I think for me, I'd have to see it and touch it to understand it. But yeah. And while we're talking about this, uh, the stuff that we have been talking about, uh, I'll put a range of photos on the show notes for this podcast. So if you have a, want to have a, a see what these things look like, go to the show notes and you'll get a better indication. But these little, um, uh, the, the little straps or little small glove, if you like, it's a good looking idea. I must admit, I've never been overly happy with the the straps that have come with tracking poles. It doesn't matter what the brands are. I, I know they're designed and they work really well, but I like the idea of, of these, even though they're aimed at running at runners, I think I could see myself getting quite comfortably used, used to them. Mm. So, I must admit, I only use the straps when there's a steep slope about. Um, so, you know, if there's a chance of dropping your pole over the side and, you know, it falling down, you're not being able to retrieve it. Um, Otherwise, I do find that they get in the way. And I've got quite comfortable ones too, but, uh, yeah, I just don't tend to use them as often. And the other one, which is not so new, we talked about the Micro Vario Carbon, which is one of their high-end poles uh, as being, you know, again, it's it's a high-end pole, but it's one of their better sellers. And it was interesting to hear him say that um, the anti-shock poles seem to be disappearing from the market. And I can remember a period three or four years ago where all the manufacturers had these anti-shock poles and they were a bit like a, uh, almost like a little piston on them um, built into construction. So when you hit the ground, you weren't sending vibrations up your arm. The idea is really nice, but the the weight, the uh, impact that it had on them and the cost just sort of, uh, obviously people didn't find them useful. Uh, and you know, you're, you're hard pressed to find anti-shock poles in stores anymore. I think they pretty much have been phased out. Yeah, I think, you know, for me it's about keeping it simple as well, you know. Yeah. Um, I must say, though, so, so, some of the – I mean, we've only got started on this um, this podcast episode, but uh, I, I love some of the names of some of these things and, and, and the features and, you know, somebody must spend a lot of time dreaming some of this stuff up. But anyway <laughs> – I think, I, think, I think it's a bit like racehorses. Every name, every name has been taken and they have to come up with something that hasn't been invented before. So, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Now, we went, then we went on to talk about Deuta, and they, they're certainly, from, you know, from an Australian perspective, are well known for their packs, although, as Alex was saying, overseas they also produce uh, uh, sleeping bags, but just something that uh, we don't tend to see here in Australia. And while he did say there were no real new packs coming on the market, there are upgrades and changes to existing packs just to make them better. Uh, and those changes will come through onto the market uh, over the coming 12 months as, uh, as the older packs uh, shift off the market, the newer packs come in to replace them. Uh, 
And it's great to see the continuing trend for uh, sustainability in hiking gear and, you know, these manufacturers looking at uh, ways to uh, reduce their impact on the environment, uh, chemicals, water, um, and uh, in the case of, of Deuter, production of greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah, so it, I think it, it's something that's becoming more and more common uh, that the companies are looking at ways of how they can reduce their environmental impact, and it's good to see. The other main bag, I suppose, from Deuter, which is, may not necessarily be something for everybody, is their new rolling luggage. Uh, and basically, this is the travel bags that you take on the planes. I've never been a big fan of the four-wheel travel bags, you know, the, the standard size suitcase. I just don't get it. Um, I do like the two-wheel bags that you've got the extendable handle on. They're more robust. They're resilient. They can be thrown around. And I think you need well. to be a better driver when you've got four oh. wheels. <laughs> yeah, you do. I think you do. Um, but, I, you know, we've been using the... Um, uh, the Helion range, and we've been using these yep. bags for, oh, God, I think it's probably been almost nine years now, mm. uh, and they are a really good bag. And, and the fact they've been on the market for so long uh, and they're only just getting around to a replacement probably around about 10 years after they came out says something about they're such a popular bag. Yeah, pretty sturdy, and they hold a lot of stuff. So uh, we tend to use them on, on the way to, to and from hikes and, and we can get our – you know, full packs in into one, and um, when uh, we need to go off hiking and we're staying at a hotel, we can leave our baggage at the hotel and come back to it at the end of the hike. I think that what you know, Alex was saying that the new range is due out towards the end of the year, early two thousand and twenty-one. So, if you're in the market for a travel bag as opposed to a hiking bag. Uh, the Helion range is really quite good and it comes in a couple of sizes, so there's likely to be some deals. In anticipation like, yeah. of the day that you can go somewhere. <laughs> so there is likely to be some deals on those in the stores over the coming months, so keep an eye out for those. And the last uh, product we'll talk about from uh, uh, that Alex co Alex's company deals with is Cliff, uh, and they're really well known for the Cliff Bars. Um I must admit, I was. I used to eat Cliff bars. I just, as much as I liked them, I found just the dry bars, not the my favourite. They were okay, but I just got a bit tired of them after a while. However, their nut butter range is excellent. I never get yeah, sick yeah. of those. I. I need to, on my longer hikes, I tend to have one every second day. I could quite easily have one every day, but I, I just, uh, you know, uh, if you're doing... That's a bit too much, I think. Yeah, yeah, if you're going on a four- to five-week hike, you need a bit of variety. So the, the cliff, we, cliff Nut Butter Bars really are excellent. Yeah, we and we tend to have to barter over the f flavours. So there are <laughs> ones that we really, really, really like and, and uh, yeah, we have to um, do deals uh, over who gets that one today. Well, I think thankfully, I think Jill likes different ones than I do, so it's not, it's normally not too bad. Yeah, I don't, I don't mind. I don't mind. <laughs> uh, and as he was saying at the end of the year, uh, the builders bars are coming out now. This might seem an odd sort of thing for a hiker, um, but for long distance hikers, this is something that's well worth thinking about. Um, normally when you're doing extreme exercise and long distance hiking falls into that, at the end of the day or the end of a session, but typically the end of the day, you want to have uh, rebuild or restock some protein into the system because this is what the body uses to repair itself uh, while you're resting and overnight. And if you don't have that protein intake, uh, it's going to affect your, uh, affect your long-term viability on a long distance trail. So I've done this in the past by using um, shakes, um, uh, things like sustagen and whole milk powder. But I'm, I think that once the builders bars come out, they will form part of my my long distance hiking uh, menu. Yeah, and um, you know the conversations we've had with um, dietitians and nutritionists um, have reinforced this that the hardest thing for a, a particularly uh, multi week you know, long distance hiker is to get enough protein into their diet. Um, the hiking foods are great, but, uh, you know, for long periods, um, yeah, you, you miss out on a few things. And last but not least, the, the shot box. And again, this is something that you probably don't think about if you're a, just a, a one or two day hiker, but on long distance hikes, I 
tried the gels, I've tried the, the mm. blocks and the chews. The shot blocks really are excellent. I tend to do a packet every two days. Uh, just when you're starting to flag a bit, particularly in the afternoon is when I have them. Uh, you know, you have one or two of these at a time, you know, every, every hour and a half, two hours. And that just gives you that extra bit of energy as you're coming towards the end of the day. So well worth considering for, for the long distance hikers. Yeah, I don't usually have that many in a day, but you know, I probably don't use as many calories, use up as many calories as you did, Tim. Yeah, I mean, and then for me, on on big days when I am long distance hiking, I'm averaging thirty odd kilometres a day. I will burn anything up to eight and a half thousand calories. So it, you know, it's pretty much impossible to carry that much food. So I expect to lose weight on a long distance hike. Um, now, one thing that um, uh, I did mention at the start of this uh, podcast is we did talk to each of the um, interviewees about what their view of the industry was over the last six to eight months, uh, and we didn't end up doing this as part of uh, the interview. I did it afterwards, and Alex's comment was um, certainly from his company's perspective because he is providing uh, cycling product as well, uh, The if you're owning a bike store or things like that, the sales have gone through the roof as everyone <laughs> tries to do it. Cycling's exercise. booming. <laughs> um, but, uh, and so, yeah, he, his company's been a bit more uh, cushioned because it's not just relying on one particular range. Uh, but he certainly has said, has said there has been a bit of variety. A number of stores um, have reduced their hours or have closed during certain periods and it's had an impact on them, uh, while other stores have done really well. So he was saying there is, is quite a bit of um, upheaval within the industry at the moment. Uh, and I think probably the biggest comment that coming away talking to Alex from was um, there's a lot of stock that hasn't been selling. Uh, so I think uh, Alex made the comment that there has been some product they've, that, that was due to be released towards the end of this year they've held off on uh, just to allow the stores to clear through some of the, the previous models. Um, so I think uh, once once things start to get back to a semblance of a normality, they'll certainly uh, 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 we'll start seeing a lot more new product coming onto the market. Okay, so that was it for um, the suppliers of Lecky, Deuter, and uh, Cliff. All right, so now we're going to talk to Cedar Summit. Uh, Cedar Summit is an Australian manufacturer that actually ships and manufactures worldwide. Uh, and today we have Ryan. Thanks for taking the time to talk to with us. Well, thanks for having me. Okay, so Cedar Summit is a brand that most people are aware of if they've been in, uh, been involved in the outdoors for for any reasonable period of time. Um, and uh, you produce a range of a large range of accessories and product. So what's new for Cedar Summit in the upcoming year? Well, I, I guess the place to start, uh, one thing that we're pretty happy about is uh, for this coming year, it'll be our, our 30th year in business. So um, even in these uh, interesting times that we're living in, uh, we're trying to find some, some reasons for celebration. And so being uh, an outdoor uh, gear manufacturer for 30 years is something that we're pretty proud of. So I guess that's one. Um, but when it comes to some of the new products that we have launching for 2021, a lot of the, the new products that we're, we'll be introducing to the market um, are in our sleep system range. So sleeping bags and sleeping mats. Um, that, that section of, of products has been something that we have really been focusing uh, quite a lot of design effort on in the last five years um, through air mats, uh, self-inflating mats, um, and a complete revamp of um, all of our uh, sleeping bags. And so then coupling that in with uh, pillows and uh, liners kind of creates this whole, this whole sleep system idea yep. uh, for us. And I, I guess to, I've, I've done a lot of clinics and I've talked a lot about sleep systems um, as a concept a lot. But, and I think uh, sometimes people, you know, everyone always has this idea of modularity with you know, putting gear together and what works best for everyone. But the idea of sleep systems is it's pretty simple, actually. It's, it's the same thing that you have at home um, in your bedroom. I mean, a sleep system is essentially a, a mattress a sheet, a pillow, and then some kind of a blanket or duvet or something to keep you warm. 
And so for us, it's the same exact concept. We've just tried to obviously make it lighter and more compact um, so you can actually carry it with you. So that that concept for us really informs how we, we build product. So we want everything to work together. Um, so, for instance, pillows are meant to be able to easily attach to the mats, the sleeping mats, so that they don't go flying away in the middle of the night. Um, and then sleeping bags um, are actually for 2021, one of the things we'll be talking about is how you can integrate different styles of sleeping bags together to um, actually create a sleep system that's best for uh, the conditions you're going to be going um, out in. So that can be you know, extremely warm summer conditions, and that can be cold conditions, and then everything um, in between. So how do you how do you select sleeping mats? How do you select sleeping bags? Um, and what options are available to you to make that um, that sleep system work for you for your trip? I think that's often the hard thing that um, if you're in a, a fairly stable climate where the, the nighttime temperatures are pretty similar and that and that's all you ever hike in, it, it, it's pretty easy to dial in a sleep system that works. But for a lot of hikers, they'll be hiking in the middle of summer, in the in the middle of winter, and the temperatures might vary at nighttime, sort of 15 to 20 degrees. So yeah, the end result being that quite often a lot of people will end up having potentially multiple sleeping mats, uh, multiple sleeping bags, and potentially uh, multiple liners, which which is what we have in our case. Yeah, I'm, I'm guilty of the same thing as well. <laughs> Granted, I work for an outdoor company, so um, I should. But ultimately, though, Tim, it's, you know, when you go on that trip, you have to pick one of them to go with you. So for me, this idea of if I'm going on a week-long uh, walk, um, or you were mentioning uh, previously that, you know, walking the, over here in uh, Western Australia, the, um, the Bibbulmun track, I mean, that takes weeks of effort to do it. So the temperature and the, the conditions are going to change dramatically um, over the course of that, that trip. So we're really trying to think about um, how can you um, make a sleep system that's really flexible, um, something that works well when it's um, hot out. Uh, something that works well when it's cold out. So it has to be able to adapt to your conditions as well. Yeah. So that's, that's an important point for us and also taking into account that everyone sleeps differently. Um, so my partner, she sleeps significantly colder than I do. So there's always a bit of an argument as to, uh, you know, what, what blankets go on, what don't, or anything like that. So that same kind of concept translates into the outdoors for us is that you, know, you always have to take into account your own personal uh, levels of comfort when it comes to, to warmth. Uh, so that's something to consider when you're making a selection for a sleeping mat or a, a liner or a sleeping bag itself. Now, I believe um, 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 talking to you before we started this interview, you were saying that one of the big pushes with the the sleeping mats in particular is the standardization of the uh, uh, of how sleeping mats are rated. That's true. So uh, this is actually a really good thing for um, for all you um, hikers and walkers out there is that um, historically um, sleeping mats have always been given some kind of a of a, of a warmth rating. Um, Traditionally, it's been expressed as an R value, which is just a measure of insulation. It's the same as if you were buying insulation for your home. That has an R value associated with it as well. Now, it, the R value can get, it's, it's a number, and it doesn't necessarily completely translate to a temperature. Um, but the idea being that the higher the number, the higher the R value per se, is the more that sleeping mat is going to insulate you from the cold ground. Um, the, the trick has been, um, over the years, every manufacturer has a dis- different testing metric um, for uh, for our values. So there's so comparing brand A to brand B, you don't necessarily get the same result um, uh, for for our value if they're tested independently. So there's been a move um, by some major retailers around the world to impose a standardization on that, and it was a it was a couple year process of getting the brands involved, getting some of the major retailers. Or, uh, involved as well to kind of come to an agreement on a, a testing protocol that everyone um, should adhere to. Um, so that way, um, if you are in the market for buying uh, a sleeping mat, you can look at this R value number and within, you know, within a pretty close um, pro- um, proximity, you can kind of understand how warm that, that mat is going to be. So, 
now that this this testing metric has been in place, it's called the ASTM um, standard. And now that it's been in place for a little over a year, um, it allows the manufacturers now to um, readdress some of the products that they've they've had on the market. So, you know, when you're you say like with an air mat, um, you have lots of options to either add insulation or take insulation away, or change the type or the location within the mat um, to really tailor um, that uh, that mat's um, specific R value. So now that we've had some time to work with it, um, we've you know we've We've noticed all of the different um, the standards, the R values for our the C to Summit range of sleeping mats, and so for 2021, the one portion of it that we hadn't really uh, uh, had in the range was something that was meant for extremely cold conditions, or quite frankly, for people that really just sleep cold. Yeah. So yeah, so there's um, for 2021 we have a a, a new uh, range of mats. Um, it's called the Etherlight Extreme. And they're what's known as an air mat. Um, and there's two main channels with, um, with sleeping mats, as I'm sure you're um, all aware, is that there's self-inflating mats and then there's air mats. Um, and self-inflating mats are, have been around for decades. Uh, and essentially, um, to really simplify it, it's, um, it's a sheet of foam that has been covered with some form of either nylon or polyester with a valve on it. So you can roll it away. Um, but when you open up that valve, the foam will expand and uh, draw air into the mat and uh, theoretically uh, self-inflate. Air mats have come on, um, you know, the last 10 plus years. It's really when it started getting going. Um, and that eliminates the foam on the inside. So you're reliant on the air pressure and uh, the amount of air you put into that mat to create a stable structure. So they've, there's been some wild variants of air mats, um, over the years. Um, and I think we launched ours maybe six years ago now. Um, and ours, the Sea to Summit mats are a, a little bit different, um, in that they're, the way they're constructed is with, um, what we call air sprung cells. So it's much like a pocket cell, um, or pocket spring mattress that you'd have at home. So there's individual, um, air spring sprung cells on each mat. Um, there's no, Baffles. So if you look at mat constructions, typically they either have long uh, chambers of of, uh, of air. So there's either vertical ones that kind of look like um, what you'd use uh, maybe if you were to go to the pool and lay on something like that. There's horizontally um, baffled mats as well. Um, and then uh, the Sea to Summit mats uh, essentially are have zero baffles. So it's they're um, there's hundreds of little dot welds that create these individual air chambers. And what that does um, for the mat is it allows the air to free to freely shift and move about within the, the sleeping mat. Yep. Um, so what that allows is that you don't get this kind of trampolining effect. Um, it spreads your weight more effectively over a um, over the concentrated areas like your your hips and your shoulders if you're a side sleeper. And it provides a bit more of a stable uh, sleep, and we find it to be a, a more comfortable way of sleeping. Um, however, um, what, you know, when you start talking about air mats as well, you know, it's that whole idea of insulation. So over here in uh, Western Australia, you know, we can get away with a almost uninsulated mat sometimes um, if the temperature is getting down to you know 28 at night and getting up to 34 in the day. If it's pretty stable, then you know you can you can pick what you want, but by far the majority of mats that we sell, um, both in Australia and uh, globally, are insulated sleeping mats. Yeah. Yep. So, and there's different ways. So with this new ASTM standard, you're looking at mats that range from, and this is not just Cedar Summit mats, but everybody's mats. They range from just below one. So anything at zero, zero basically means there's no insulation at all. There's no, there's, it does nothing for you in terms of warmth. All the way up to, I think there's some down mats on the market that, that get up to about eight, um, around there. That's, so anything that's, that's pretty tasty. It's really warm, actually. That's that's pretty incredible. Um, and the trick is though, as you add insulation, we always have to be aware that somebody's going to have to carry this um, and pack it away. Yeah. So you, you're always having this this balance between packability, lightweight, and insulation. Uh, so you're trying to find that happy medium. And most mats in the air mat area will come in between, you know, two as a at the low end for an insulated mat, um, up to about a five 
And that's anything above a three and a half or somewhere in that range. And this is where it gets a bit um, subjective based on, you know, uh, other, other factors for, for warmth. But anything around that two and a half uh, range is good for summer and um, some cooler temperatures that you would you'd get in most conditions around summer. When you get up to five, now you're getting into things that are acceptable for full winter conditions in the mountains um, as well. I think that's the, the thing with a lot of people. They'll, they'll, they'll often focus so much on the sleeping bag and spend a lot of money on the sleeping bag and then buy a really cheap or really poor quality mat uh, and not realise that if you, you need to balance both of them out, otherwise you're not going to get the results you want. It's really true. Um, and if you think about all the trips that you've ever taken, um, if you're, say, again, let just go back to, to walking the Billman track, I, I, I would – bet you spend at least a third of your entire trip laying on your sleeping mat. Yeah. So it's a really important part of the system. And if you're not getting a good night's sleep, if you're cold, if you're uncomfortable, it really impacts the rest of the day as well. So it's, it's one of those things where um, we've spent a lot of design effort to try and um, make it more comfortable because ultimately that's what comes down to. So warmth is a, is a, is a, is a function of comfort. So different people have different acceptabilities of what warmth is, but this new ASTM standard at least gives you a, a baseline for comparison. So that's a lot of me talking without saying anything about the new maps we have coming out. <laughs> I, I think having that background is, 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 is makes sense, though, because as, as I said, most people will spend all their effort on the sleeping bags and they'll just buy, they'll often buy a sleeping mat based on price without realizing what the features involved are. So it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's the education is, is particularly important with the mats. And technology has improved so much with mats, um, just particularly as of late. It's, it's a lot of it is fabric technology, it's uh, like fabric welding technology, being able to make something that is um, both lightweight and packable and now actually much thicker, but also durable enough to be used as a piece of gear that you're going to take on a, a walk for a month. It's got to be able to withstand not necessarily purely just abrasion from the outside, um, but also it needs to be able to um, uh, be strong enough and the bonds um, between the laminates of fabrics and all these different RF welding techniques that go in that it doesn't um, fail from the inside out. And that's actually probably the most important thing because if you find, if you get a hole in an air mat, um, it's a relatively simple process these days to fix that. I mean, the hardest part about it now is actually finding where the hole is. Yep. But once you do, um, there's a coating on the outside of the Sea to Summit mats. Um, it's an acrylic coating that is specifically formulated to bond with a repair um, patch. So it's just a sticker. It's a, it's a 3M patch that you just peel the back off of, stick it onto the over the hole, and you know, wait about 20 minutes and you're you're good to go. So that's the easy part. The hard part is if um, you're blowing warm, moist air into a, an air mat for an extended period of time, uh, what happens um, had a tendency to happen is you get this um, like you have you're introducing you know, like I said, warm, moist air into a closed ecosystem. And so the bonds between some of these um, these laminates and these um, these RF welds can get broken down by um, absorption of water. Yep. So that's something that we spent, um, took us about three years to launch our first air mat, and that was the major problem that we were really trying to, to resolve. So you can do that by adding antimicrobials inside of it as well, but really what it comes down to is how strong is the bond between the face fabric, is what you're laying on, and then the interior of the mat, which is usually some kind of a, a different fabric. And in this case, for us, it would be an extruded TPU laminate, um, which if you were to weigh the componentry parts of an air mat, the, the majority of the weight in the mat is what's on the inside. Yep. So it's actually this, this fabric on the inside, not what, you, not what you're sleeping on. Um, so, And then if you want to talk about warmth, um, that's where you start thinking about. So with this concept in mind of balancing weight, packability, and also warmth on the inside of the mat, you know, you have to put something in there to, to keep you warm. So if you're getting, you know, not getting too technical, but the way you lose heat um, on a mat is going to be one of three ways. It's either going to be radiative heat loss. So you're just, that's just the heat escaping from you just all around you. And that's really the job um, of the sleeping bag 
is to trap that radiative heat loss. Um, in a sleeping mat, you can add something like a, what we put as x platinum, which is kind of a, it's material, it's similar to a, in concept to a space blanket, except yeah. without that, you know, really crinkly um, sound that the space blankets have. And that's radiating that heat right back at you. Uh, so that's one way. Um, you can lose heat um, conductively. So if you're actually touching something, um, like if you if you touch a, a cold metal pole on a winter's morning, you'll pretty pretty quickly know what uh, conductive heat loss is. Um, and then that's the same as with water. Um, water will transmit; it'll conduct heat much faster than air. Yep. Um, and then there's um, uh, convective heat loss. And that's actually, it's a tricky one to explain, but convective heat loss is basically air currents. And you wouldn't think that the majority of uh, the heat loss experienced in a mat would be from air currents, but it really is. Um, so if you have, it's just a, a uh, if you're laying on an air mat and you have one side that you're laying on is really warm and the ground is really, really cold, you'll develop little, little air currents will form inside of even a closed system like a, a an air mat. And that'll actually start actively moving heat away from uh, from the warm source, which unfortunately is you. So in order to, to, to beat that, you need to put something inside the mat. It can't just be an open air chamber. Um, you have to have something in there to break up convective air currents. So what we fill the mats with is thermalite, which is a, uh, it's a hollow core um, synthetic microfiber um, that has lots and lots of um, uh, surface area to it so it's like even the it's um, less than a micron thick these things and even the individual strands of less than a micron thick are hollow so you're really creating a lot of um, surface area on these on this in thermalite uh, and that just helps to trap um, both um, heat so if it's for radiative heat loss but also it breaks up those air currents so the mats get warmer yeah so again, I'm still talking more about mats and not about the new one, but I guess where that leads me, Tim, is that this, the new mat we're launching is, um, it's called the Etherlite Extreme, which is based on, um, our best selling, uh, new range of, of, uh, sitting mats called the Etherlites. Um, and what we've done is created a mat that actually has an R value of 6.2, uh, for the, uh, but it's pretty good. Yeah. It's, it's really warm. <laughs> And then we actually make a, a women's specific version, which actually has a 6.3. Um, and how we achieved it essentially is because you have the same frame of the, so the mat is built the same way as our standard insulated um, uh, ether lights, but uh, there's a lot more thermalite insulation going on on the inside. So you end up with uh, two different type, two different densities of uh, synthetic fill insulation on the inside of the mat. So, um, about half of it, so the top half, uh, which is what you'd be laying next to, is a really dense um, uh, layer of thermalite. And that's, if that high density is just really there, obviously, next to you to trap that heat. Um, and then essentially, the, there's a the section that's you know, next to the ground is a high loft. So it's not as dense, um, but it is there essentially to, um, to hold that really... Um, to hold the, the, the really dense layer of thermalite up against you, but also to break up, to fill the entire mat and break up any of those convective air currents that could possibly form. So on that ASTM standard test, that's where we come back with you know, 6.2 and 6.3. So that's going to be, um, that's going to be something to consider if you really either get really cold or you plan on doing, um, uh, winter style trips. So, so these these ones are really meant meant for when you say winter, probably more my snow conditions. You're you're looking at through there. Oh. Yeah, you know this is and it's funny. Like with snow, um, snow is actually quite insulative. Um, so if you were to put a mat down on snow itself, it's not the worst. It's, it sounds horrible, but it's actually warmer than um, putting a mat down on on cold rock. Okay, and that gets down to that that conductivity of the of the surface that you're actually laying on. Um, so. Traditionally, in a, in a, like if you were going, uh, even heaven forbid, if you were going to go do a, a ski traverse in Antarctica, um, traditionally what you have to do is you bring two sleeping mats. You bring a closed cell foam mat, um, which generally speaking, that'd be like, and there's a bunch of brands out there, but I guess, um, the Ridge Rest is a, um, a good example of that. And they have an R value of about two for an example. Um, and the, an air mats, like I said, get up to about, 
three and a half to five. So if you have a, if you combine the two, you can add the two R values together to, to kind of work it out. So having a standalone mat um, that's an air mat, so you get the benefits of it being uh, really packable um, and also lightweight and to come in with a, an R value of 6.3 is, um, it's really good for these kind of conditions. So you're looking at a mat that's going to weigh in, you know, at, uh, under 700 grams yep. you know, for the women's regular. And I think the men's regular is just a touch over 700 grams. Um, and that's something with an R value that can uh, take you very, very comfortably um, anywhere in Australia, even on the coldest night and actually insulate you well from the ground. I think that you know it's certainly not going to be in the lightest end of the range. There are a lot of lot of mats that you produce and other companies produce, but as you say, from a warmth and comfort perspective, um, you know if you feel the cold, it, it it it's no good having a lightweight sleeping mat if you're freezing to death. It, you, you, it's not exactly. not not, not, going to, not going to work. Yeah, that extra two hundred grams. I think at about two o'clock in the morning, you'd be uh, kicking yourself um, as you're lying there shivering. So it's it, it's just a, it, essentially what it does is it gives. Um, Gives people a selection. So now you've got a range. Because uh, some people, you know, like, you know, there are people do all kinds of crazy trips out there, and that's why we've called this the extreme. And I, I from when I've uh, I've used the Etherlite in the past, and it, it it's certainly one of the most comfortable mats I've actually used as well. It it really is. Uh, something you, it's a joy to sleep on. So um, having so, having that extra bit of extra warmth, uh, my, my my wife would certainly appreciate that. Yeah. And so the nice thing of it, and the reason why I guess those ether lights have really become come to the forefront is and that's where I was talking about forest technology. Um, and when you have an air mat, I mean, if it is 10 centimeters thick. That's really a bit of a game changer. Um, because if you have, I mean, mats can be very, very comfortable and be thin. Um, the difference being though is that you have to put a lot of, of air pressure into it in order to support you off the ground. Yeah. So the thinner the mat, the harder, the, the higher the air pressure. So if, if if you're somebody who likes a firmer mattress, you know, then that's great. It works for you. Um, I'm a side sleeper. So for me, uh, if I have to run the, the mattress at a really high pressure, you know, I feel it more on the hips and shoulders. So being 10 centimeters thick means that the way I use the Etherlite is I will put, um, basically I'll, I'll, I'll inflate it and then lay on it and I'll, I'll decrease the pressure through the valve just so that my shoulders and hips touch the ground when I'm lying on my side. I'll hop off the mat, put one more breath back in, and then then I know I never bottom out, and I, I end up with a very comfortable sleep for me. Um, so that's one way to do it. But that extra 10 centimeter, I mean, that 10 centimeters of thickness allows me to run it at a much lower pressure. Um, so it's just how I feel um, a mat to be comfortable yeah, no, I, I agree with that. I, 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 I'm typically a side sleeper, but I'll toss and turn from back to front to side, and and yeah, and mm. I do tend to bounce. <laughs> so when I do bounce on the side, it's, it, you bottom out if you if you haven't got enough enough air pressure in there. So uh, yeah, it really does help. Okay, so um, and that's the that's the main sleeping mat you've got coming out. Yeah, you, know, you mentioned you've also yeah. got a a foam a new foam mat as well. Yeah, we do. So the um, the self-inflating mat range for us, um, self-inflating mats, I mean, they've been out, like I said, for you know, a couple decades, but by no means are they um, a, a lesser mat. In some ways, they have their, each has their own advantages. Air mats obviously will pack up um, smaller, so they're more compressible and they're generally speaking lighter weight. Um, the advantage is really of a uh, self-inflating mat um, is that they're very easy to use because of that self-inflating property that they have by the, the air mats being able to, or by the foam self-expanding um, self and then bringing the air in for you. So you don't have to go through that whole process of, um, of blowing up an air mat, um, even though those things can be quite easy now, with different ways and pumps and things like that. But um, that's one element of a, of a um, self-inflating mat that's advantageous. The other one is that they're inherently warmer because of the fact that we talked about the um, you know, conductive air currents. So air mats that are insulated by design have to put things into them in order to, to keep you warm. A self-inflating mat, generally speaking, already has that foam in there. So they start out at a, at a warmer base uh, to begin with. Um, so our self-inflating mat ranges are ASPM tested as well. They all go through the same testing protocol. Um, the trick with self-inflating mats, though, is 
um, how do you balance that packability and lightweight, um, you know, concept with them? So it's all about removing foam from a construction standpoint. So you can, you can do it many different ways. You can, most manufacturers will, um, just basically drill out from the side or vertically, uh, cores of foam. And that typically removes about 20% of the foam from the mat. Um, yep. However, what we ended up doing what we, when we launched the, our range of self-inflating mats from Seed Summit, we tried to figure out how can we remove more foam from the internal of the, uh, the mat to make it lighter and more compressible, but without compromising that long-term durability. Because again, if your mattress fails on your trip, that's a, that, that's a big interruption of, of your comfort and your enjoyment of your, of your outdoor trip. So it had to be designed such that we didn't uh, take out chunks of foam. Um, we wanted to maintain an integrity between the, the face fabric and the foam itself. So, um, no big swaths of fabric or of foam taken out, uh, in order to cut weight. So we have, we have a, a style of coring called Delta coring, and it's actually has to be cut out with a, uh, a blade as opposed to, um, a drill. So you end up with a much more involved manufacturing process, but the end result being that we can remove 40% of the foam. Um, and so making it lighter and more packable, um, but not compromising that long-term durability and sticking with that concept of uh, thicker is better. Um, the, one of the, the styles of, of mats or actually the style of mat that we're launching for 2021 is called the, um, the camp plus, um, and plus for us usually means something, obviously it sounds pretty simple, but something else is going on, something more. So the plus for us is that it's a thicker mat. Um, it has our Delta uh, coring, so it removes about 40% of the foam. But these mats now are coming in um, at about eight centimeters thick, so almost as, as thick as the um, our, our thickest Etherlite ones. Um, but they're coming in at um, a significantly lower uh, price point. So, like a, an extreme uh, Etherlite extreme mat can get over you know 350 dollars um, Australian. Whereas the Camp Plus mat will be 150. Okay. So, yeah, so it's it, it's essentially applying this the same kind of technology. It's going to be a little bit bulkier. Um, it's going to be a little bit um, less packable, but it's also significantly more approachable. And you know, it's a different way of going about comfort, but it is an extremely comfortable. And and self-inflating mats are also quiet to sleep on. Um, there's so many different layers of fabric and things going on with air mats that they end up, you know, if you're, you know, they're louder to sleep on, um, just by the function of being an air mat than a, a mat that is completely filled with foam, yeah. you know, so there are certain advantages, um, as well. So that's another one to look for in 2021, which is a, um, an eight centimeter thick, um, mat that's going to weigh in, uh, the regular, I think is actually still, uh, it's about, somewhere in the mid 800s in grams. So it's not what we consider to be an ultra light mat. Um, but, um, it is something that would be what I potentially would pick if I was going car camping or if I wasn't necessarily, um, prioritizing, um, weight or compressibility is my, my first criteria. It's a very, very comfortable and easy to use mat too. Yep. Okay. And I think the R values like in the fours, four, four and a half. So still warm. It's still pretty good. It's still pretty good. Mm. Okay, so now moving on from the um, the sleeping mats, we're looking at sleeping bags or or sleeping bag options. So what what's new for Cedar Summit in that range? Um, well, there's again, I guess it's going back to that idea of um, versatility within within sleeping bags. So sleeping bags are um, they're actually a pretty big part of what we do, um, and. When you look at sleeping bags, um, it's, as a manufacturer, we have a range of, of different options. Um, and a lot of that is based around if we're just sticking with, say, down at your insulation um, for sleeping bags, there's different, obviously, there's different rating systems for how do you measure down. Um, so that's with your, um, your fill power or loft rating, um, whatever way you want to call it. But there's always a number associated with that as well. So those can be you know, 850, 750, 650, uh, 550, um, and so on and so forth. And 
without getting too deep into the weeds on that, um, the higher the number basically means that for the same amount of weight of, of down that you put in something, um, you get a, um, a better return on um, the warmth for that. So basically it's using the imperial system. It's an ounce of down by volume. And if you fill a, a graduated cylinder with an ounce of, um, with an ounce of down, you put a, a standardized weight on top of that, and then you get to see um, how much um, that, uh, how big of a cubic area that will that will fill. So, and uh, so we have a range of 850 bags, 750 bags, and 650 um, sleeping bags. Um, and so that kind of that, that that's how you kind of determine the pricing structure almost of. You know, if you're looking um, at sleeping bags, an A50 bag for a manufacturer, the down itself costs twice as much to buy 850 as it does um, 750. Yeah. So you end up with, um, you know, once you get into those higher numbers, it starts getting to be, um, um, you know, just a more expensive offering to get that extra performance. So with that in mind, um, just looking at what's new, actually one of the things I, I, I think we should talk about um, is our uh, quilts. And we've been noticing, um, well, a lot of us um, that work at Cedar Summit, we use quilts. Uh, so there's, there's several advantages to a quilt over a traditional sleeping bag. Um, one is which, if, you know, it depends what you're using it for, but one of the main advantages of quilts is that they are inherently are lighter. You don't have a zipper. Um, you're just left with a, like a, a down duvet. So they're, they're lighter weight. Generally speaking, they're going to be more compressible because zippers don't don't compress very well. Uh, they're going to be a little bit less expensive, um, mainly because of all that extra construction that you have to do with the zippers and things like that for sleeping bags. Um, the down and the, the fabric, you know, they're all still pretty high end as well. You can get a range of products, so they don't necessarily have to be less expensive. But what it comes down to is why are you know, what's the advantage of, of a quilt uh, besides just weight and compressibility? And if you are going out in summer, the major advantage of a quilt is that it works very well um, over a wide range of, I'd say, warmer temperatures. So the problem with mummy sleeping bags um, is that they can be pretty restrictive if it gets really warm out, unless you have one that fully opens and unzips. Um, so a quilt allows you on a warm night to stick a leg out. Um, to you know, half throw it off of you, um, you know, keep your feet out the bottom, or anything like that. So they're really, they're really quite comfortable and versatile for summer weight, um, for summer weight camping. The issue with them has always been that when the temperature drops, you're going to be um, more challenged to stay warm uh, because you're not fully in a, uh, a sleeping bag. Now. Partly, um, the reality is when you're laying on a, uh, in a sleeping bag, you are compressing the, the down on the bottom side of it. So it's not giving you as much warmth as, um, you might think. That's where the, that's where the mat really comes into play. Yeah. That's why it's that importance of actually having a good sleeping mat underneath you is so, so valuable for warmth. Um, but with quilts, you know, you don't, you're basically just taking that notion of having any down below you and just throwing it out the window and just relying on your mat. So as mats now have gotten to be warmer um, as well, it allows you to find different, more creative ways to both cut weight out of your, your sleep system, um, like your sleeping bag, and not necessarily have any um, drop in performance for warm weather. So they can lighten your system up. Um, and they can be better when the temperature is um, hot out. Like I mean, I'm sure, like part of it. If we all talk when we start talking about sleeping bags, we always seem to focus on um, warmth, and that's a it's a bit of a two way street though. Uh, I'm sure that you've had an experience in a sleeping bag where you've woken up at two in the morning, completely roasting, <laughs> <laughs> and you can't seem to get out of that bag fast enough. Um, so that's that's one of the things that a quilt really can can help um, moderate uh, in that in those conditions where you really don't need the full to be fully um, covered in um, a sleeping bag. You know, you can use a quilt to um, be a bit more comfortable and um, have better ventilation options on summer nights. So 
that's one thing. But so when we started looking at, at quilts for 2021, um, that's kind of a big ask for, um, for a gear manufacturer to um, ask or to want somebody to buy a, you know, an 850 loft, very expensive down quilt for, you know, quite frankly, could be a, a very limited number of nights that they would choose that. Um, so if it's, and it's, you know, they can be, they can be expensive. So why would a customer want to buy um, a, uh, a quilt over a sleeping bag? And the reality is kind of what you were talking about at the beginning is that most people that would buy a quilt already have a sleeping bag. So they're looking for a way to lighten up their existing sleep system. You know, they want their pack weight to be lighter. They're going out in summer and they want to have, you know, maybe their backpack smaller. They're on this process as we all are of trying to find um, the lightest possible system that still works for us, keeps us warm, comfortable. So it's it's another tool, it's another arrow in the, the quiver, so to speak, is to think about quilts uh, as for that um, that purpose. But what we tried to do for 21 was think about how you can integrate a quilt into your sleep system um, to use it for more than just that warm that warm temperatures. So what we what we've actually done with this uh, with the quilts is that we've made them so that you can actually integrate them over top of your your existing sleeping bag, whether it's a, a Sea to Summit one, we make it really easy to integrate with the Sea to Summit ones, but you still can integrate them with any brand's um, sleeping bag out there. So what that means is that you get in your normal sleeping bag um, and then you can actually attach the, the quilt so it stays on top of the bag. So it doesn't, it won't shift off or anything like that. And it's not really done with, um, uh, you have the ability to strap the, the, the quilt um, over the entire sleep system. So around the mat on the bottom, um, over the sleeping bag itself. So you can actually significantly boost the warmth of a, um, of a existing sleeping bag. Um, so if you had a, a bag that was rated down to say like, you know, five degrees, and then you have a quilt that's rated, um, you know, have a comfort rating of maybe down to, you know, 15 degrees or something like that, or 10 degrees. I'm kind of making these numbers up. Um, essentially, by stacking them together, um, you can dramatically um, increase the warmth of that sleep system. Yeah. So, so now what I'm, it's kind of removing this idea that this barrier that if I just get a, a quilt, it's only going to be good for just for uh, warm conditions. So now you can kind of pick and choose what you want to take with you. So, so if you're just saying you're going out on a, a two-night quick overnight, and you're going extreme, extremely light and fast, you know, you can just, you know, grab the, grab the quilt, you know, and you already have your good mat. So that kind of takes care of the insulation on the bottom side. And then you have this, you know, a perfect little sleep system for, for warmer conditions. If it's the mid kind of range and you're unsure, then you, you reach for your sleeping bag, you know, then if you're going to be going out um, something in winter or in a colder condition and you need to have a combination of both, then you can, you can quickly combine the two. Um, and it's a heck of a lot less expensive than buying a, a third additional sleeping bag. Um, and it's just, it's a way to um, make your existing gear uh, work um, over a, a wider range of temperatures. Just trying to be more adaptable. Yeah. So it's, it's, so it's pretty much layer, layering your sleep system as opposed to layering your clothing. You, 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 you're not just, you know, the old, the old, the old traditional method, I suppose, is you'd have a sleeping bag. Uh, liners have become more and more common and more popular over the last sort of five to ten years, uh, and now yeah. we're, now we're layering again with a uh, an additional warmth layer uh, and building on a, a system that gives you the versatility. Exactly, um, and I mean that's precisely it. Uh, so it, it's giving another um, option um, for building a, a sleep system that is both versatile and comfortable. So you've you've already had um, you've had the range of ember quilts over the last few years. So is this a, just a, yeah. a a revamp to that range, or is it a new range that's coming out? Well, so the a couple of different the things the the ember range um, has had a few uh, updates to it in order to make it so it can uh, basically so it can be layered into a, an existing sleep system. So it'll have a couple additional snaps. Uh, so there's uh, snap systems that allow it to snap into the foot and to the um, 
the, the basically the the head just below the the hood of the sleeping bag. So there's a way to really quickly attach them to see the summit bags. Um, yep. They've also changed their strapping system so that the straps now have gotten wider. Um, they also have a fast release buckle. So you don't have to thread them anymore. Uh, so that allows you to have um, uh, just an easier way to, to use the quilt. The snaps also can be used to go around your neck to kind of create a neck gaiter if it gets really cold. Um, so you can actually snap that quilt almost like a, a poncho around you. Yep. Um, as well. So that's, that's the 850 range. So those are our premium quilts. Um, we've also launched a, and this is what's brand new for your 2021 will be the, the cinder, uh, quilt. And the, the cinder essentially is using 750 plus, um, ultra dry down. So you get to cut some of the, uh, the cost out of the bag. Um, but it's actually, uh, going to be using, um, a type of fabric that's actually a, a waterproof breathable fabric on the outside. So the, the embers are going, their, their mission is to be as light as possible. So they'll have a, a seven denier and a, and a 10 denier fabric. So seven on the inside, 10 on the outside. Yep. And that is for just to be as ultimately lightweight as you can possibly get. The, the new cinders will be a 20 uh, denier nylon. Um, and that's actually using a waterproof breathable nano shell fabric. So it's really good against wind. So if you're sleeping out under a tarp or anything like that, um, or in a hammock, they're, they're fantastic for those kind of open, um, open bivy kind of a setups. Um, and then it's also going to be really good against it's, like I said, it's a waterproof breathable. This, the seams aren't taped on it, but the, the fabric itself, um, you know, won't be, uh, taking in dew or moisture or any kind of things like that. Yeah. So that's a, a pretty lightweight setup and you can get those. I mean, a full cinder quilt, I believe, is going to be just a, you know, it's below 500 grams in, in weight. So they're very lightweight um, and also going to be uh, very versatile. And with quilts, you know, it's a bit of a comfort range thing for people. But, you know, our quilts are basically uh, going to be particularly, say, the cinder. It's about, um, you know, four degrees to 10 degrees, um, depending on you. And your sleep system that you're using, if you got a really warm mat, you know, all those things, those factors can, can affect it. But, um, it's not from below zero or anything, but with a, um, you know, if you layer that on top of another bag, you can get away with a lot of that. Yeah. And, uh, and then essentially too, we, we're going to be doing the, um, we have a, another quilt. It's a synthetic fill. Um, it's called, uh, the glow. Um, and the glow essentially is using, um, like I said, it's not down, it's synthetic. Um, and the main advantage of that is twofold. One, it's going to be, um, have a lower price point, uh, just because down is quite pricey. Um, the other thing that's good about the, the glow too is that if you are doing, uh, water based trips or if you're down in an area like the south coast of Tassie or something where it's just, you are, it is going to be wet at some point in time. And this is, you know, synthetics do have that inherent uh, advantage of um, in really, really wet conditions. They're impervious to um, to water. So hey, there's there's an advantage to those too. No, that's good. That's good. And I think I think I, I know with a lot of the um, the school based trips and the um, and, and the, the the companies that take people out on trips, they'll often use the the synthetic. Uh, but uh, products as well, just because they're more durable and and they often do tend to be a, a lot cheaper than the uh, the very lightweight um, uh, uh, high end products. Um, mm. Much easier to buy 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10 quilts or ten <laughs> sleeping bags that are half the price than it is to go full on. Yeah, and you know, like the, the glow too, it's still using thirty D uh, shell fabric and twenty D liner, so it's still a really technical build to it. Yeah. Um, it's just trying, like, again, trying to create a range of options for people to, to use. Okay, no, that's good. So um, now we've gone through and talked about the, the, the new product, which is due for release. Now, you said 2021. Is that in the first mm -hmm. three to four months of the year or a bit later on, are you expecting? Uh, that'll be in the first. Uh, they should probably, they should be in store by about March. Okay, so that's, that's pretty, pretty typical for release mm -hmm. times. So just uh, one of the questions we've been asking people with these interviews is how have you seen the outdoor industry um uh, change or or move in the last sort of six to eight months with 
both the fires and also with the uh, the pandemic we're having at the moment? What's been the the big changes that you've seen? Uh, it's this is this year has been the, the most change I've ever seen in my I guess it's twenty yeah twenty four years of being in the outdoor industry. This 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 season this year has been absolutely crazy. Um, I don't think we've ever seen anything quite like it. Uh, traditionally, when something happens um, in the world, the outdoor industry um, seems to still do pretty well because people, if they can't travel, they will stay, they stay close to home. If you know, if there's a recession or any of these things happen, there's always nature to go back to, um, and that's something we fall back on. Um, and you know, obviously, because you and I are sitting here doing this podcast, it's it's something that's near and dear to our hearts as well. So. Um, that's kind of the irony of it is that you know, if things go wrong in the world, you know, people you know go outside and go do things. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. With this, this combination of the fires and the pandemic has just been um, very, very different. People are still getting out um, from, I, I can, even when we were on lockdown, you know, you're just sitting there planning away and you know, working in my garage on, you know, fixing up my gear and just getting ready to go back out and just pouring over maps and books and things like that. But as an industry as a whole, it's, um, as a manufacturer, it's, it's very different times. Uh, so, you know, a lot of manufacturing um, happens, um, on a global scale. So it's, it's been very difficult to develop product. Um, it's very different to, because what we end up doing as a manufacturer is we'll, go through multiple, multiple iterations of a, of a product before we're ready to, to launch it um, to the uh, to the market. So that whole process really slows down. Um, so that's a bit of a challenge. Um, the other thing is that, uh, you know, when stores are shut, retailers, um, uh, your, you know, your local outdoor store is, you know, is shut and can't open. That can be challenging as well because um, those are the outlets that we that we move our our products through, and those are the people that we've been partnering with for years and years. So we want to make sure that they're um, going to stay in business. Um, so if you haven't done it done so already, support your local outdoor store. <laughs> yep. Um, uh, vote for their experience because uh, they're the ones that actually can help you uh, select the right gear because they get, I mean, I'm, I'm, I work for Seated Summit. So obviously my focus is, um, you know, Seated Summit, but uh, the people at your local shop, they, they get to look at Seated Summit. They look at all the other brands and they can really have a discussion with you on what, what works best for, for you and your trips. Um, so it's been really challenging. And so we, um, you know, there's lots of products that we're not launching for 2021 um, because Essentially, by doing so, we would make existing products that are in uh, outdoor shops right now obsolete. And, um, it's not necessarily the time to be doing that. So we're trying to take a longer uh, term approach to this. Like I said, we've been in, in business now for 30 years and we plan on being in business for the next 30. So um, that is uh, that's kind of an overarching theme for uh, for this next year is um, that's what we're we're trying to just focus on what's what's new and what's going to make. What what products can we launch that are actually going to solve problems? Yeah, yeah. So it's it's not just um, you know putting products out because we, we think we can you know make a dollar by doing so. It's really trying to figure out what's something that a, a hiker or a kayaker or a bike packer is really going to need on a trip. What 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 is out there that we need to improve upon? So that's really this this idea of of um, getting outside. And, you know, when, when places are closed and you can't go there, it's, it's, it's quite challenging. All right. That's good. That's good to hear. It's sort of, um, it seems to be a bit of a common theme to, as we've been talking to people. It's sort of, uh, it is definitely a time of change. And I think it'll be a, an interesting year once we do get through this pandemic to, to see uh, all the new things that are that have been held back by a lot of companies that'll that'll all hit the market in 2022 onwards. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that'll be. <laughs> that'll be an interesting one. Okay, so we've been talking to Ryan from Cedar Summit. Thanks very much for taking the time to talk to us. Well, thank you very much for having me. I really, really appreciate it.
Okay, so that was Ryan Seacrest. And for those of you that are probably in my age bracket, that name probably rings a bell as a, <laughs> a, <poor> a, guy. <laughs> a, a, a DJ on the top 40 out of the uh, the US. Um, but yeah, I, I did ask, ask him if he was the same person. So he said he gets that all the time. Now, Ryan made a couple of uh, interesting comments and I, I hadn't really thought about this, but Cedar Summit turns 30 years old or 30 years young uh, and as an Australian company that was started uh, all those years ago, it's still growing strong and they're producing product that is now shipped worldwide. Um, you go to the States, you go to Europe and you will see Cedar Summit product. So it's good that we're actually exporting an Australian product to the rest of the world. And, and a pretty big range of products too. So it's not just a couple of things here and there. I mean, they, you know, they've really got a quite a breadth of uh, gear available. I did actually ask him outside of the interview about whether they'd ever get into clothing, and he said, I think I think that's the last thing he'd ever want to do, uh, <laughs> having to, to release new colours and things like that almost every every few months. Is, is He said it's a nightmare. Well, I don't know why he would have thought that um, Cedar Summit would have to do that if they were doing clothing because nobody else seems to do that. It's always the same <laughs> colours. Yeah, well, that's right, that's right. <laughs> Um, so we spent the first part of the interview talking about the Cedar Summit philosophy and they've always had the philosophy about sleep systems, which is something we're, we're big fans of as well, that you're not just looking at a sleeping bag, you're not just looking at a sleeping mat, you're not just looking at the clothing, it's everything that goes together. And I think when a lot of people start buying gear, they think, oh, I'll bet I'll buy the, the most expensive or the the lightest weight sleeping bag I can find. And if you don't pair it with the right sleep mat uh, or you don't wear the right clothing, it's not necessarily going to work. Um, so it is it is the sort of thing that you've got to look at this as a system uh, and you've got to try and get... You get you, unless you have an unlimited amount of money, everyone has a budget there somewhere, you're going to have to try and choose the lightest, the cheapest, and the product that is going to suit your needs that you can afford. And it might mean a um, not spending so much on a sleeping bag, but getting a better quality sleeping mat uh, to make the difference. So it really is worthwhile thinking about that. Ryan talked about their new range of sleeping mats, and that's the Etherlite Extremes. They've had the Etherlite mats out for... Um, it's probably been about 12 to 18 months now. Uh, they are a very comfortable mat. Uh, we had the opportunity to test one um, in the last year. Um, and they're not the lightest sleeping mats on the market, but they are a very, very comfortable mat. Uh, and this is often the issue that um, the fixation with getting the lightest um, there is a trade-off when you're doing something like this, and it's a trade-off between weight and comfort quite often. Uh, and getting a good night's sleep, yes, you need to be warm, uh, but you also need to be comfortable as well, uh, and that can make a big difference. So sometimes going those extra few grams in weight can have, be a big impact. Yeah, it is a bit of a compromise, and uh, I think sometimes you have to decide what's more important to you. Um, uh, someone did say to me uh, a while back that after a few sleepless nights, you're probably going to be okay on the fourth night. Yeah. <laughs> You'll sleep anywhere because you're that tired. I'm not sure if that kind of holds up, but uh, yeah, so. Uh, that, that was actually an ex-army officer. Who'd <laughs> <laughs> obviously slept in uh, some pretty ordinary places, um, yeah. So Ryan was saying that the Etherlite Extreme was a, an R value of 6.2 uh, and the women's version, which is an R value of a 6.3. Um, and typically females do feel the cold uh, more readily than males do. It's not just an imaginary thing, it's a physiological thing. So typically the women's sleeping bags will often be a bit warmer and often shorter as well in slightly different shape. Sleeping mats will be the same. They tend to be slightly thicker, have that bit of extra warmth um, uh, to get the uh, the same degree of comfort that, that a male will do with a lesser rating 
of mat and sleeping bag. Those ratings are pretty high, though, aren't they? I mean, there's not many on the market with such a high. No, there's there's not really at the moment. I think there's probably um, with these two on coming onto the market, there's probably only about three uh, on the market that are in that sort of category, and these will keep you toasty warm in snow conditions. Um, um, but the other thing to think about as well, and I hadn't thought about this, Ryan, as someone who's coming from the States and coming from snow conditions, he was actually saying that snow is an insulator. Um, sleeping on cold rock with a, a sleeping mm-hmm. mat or cold ground will often suck the heat out of you more so than sleeping on snow. So, I'm not sure I want to try e- any of those <laughs> out, but yeah. <laughs> Um, so the Etherlite uh, extremes will be available in um, the first three, three, three to four months of uh, 2021. So um, again, even if you don't want to wait until that time until they're available, um, you may expect to find some sales coming up over the coming months uh, as people start shifting older stock, making way for the new stock coming in. Ryan also talked about a new self-inflating mat. Now, these were an older style mat. We went from the thick pieces of foam to the self-inflating mats to the inflatable mats. And the self-inflating mats aren't necessarily obsolete. Uh, And as Ryan indicated, these are an excellent option for car camping. They're a bit heavier they're much cheaper than the um, inflatable mats. Uh, and the new mat that's coming through is, he was saying, it's going to have an R value of around about four, which is a pretty warm uh, mat for most people. Um, yeah, and when you don't necessarily want to spend five, you know, close on $500 for a, uh, an, a high-grade insla- inflatable mat, you know, getting something that's probably around half the price uh, where you're not concerned about bulk or weight and it'll roll up into a car and fit into a car quite comfortably. So, you know, a new the new inflatable mats are something that you know you wouldn't expect to be around, but they certainly have um have their place uh, and again particularly for car camping really good option to go for. Yeah, and I think, you know, this just keeps coming back to uh what you need, um what works for you and uh what's going to fit within your the, the kind of uh, hiking um, and tenting, I'll call it, tenting that you do. Now we moved on to um, the new sleeping bag slash quilt range. And before we sort of ta- start talking about the specifics, and, and it's something I hadn't thought about before, I've always been aware of loft as far as a term in sleeping bags is concerned. And really what this comes down to, it's it's a way of describing the amount of warmth that a, a given amount of down will generate. Uh, and generally you've got a 650, a 750 and an 850 down that Cedar Summit use. There are lower grades of loft of down available. There are also higher grades but that is really rare, the high grade. I've, I've seen 900, 950 loft down, but really rare. I think there's only one or two sleeping bags in the world that use that sort of down. But Ryan was saying that the 850 gram or 850 loft down is twice the cost of 750 loft down. Wow. So when you think, well, okay, why is this bag, it's only an extra 100, whatever measurements of that is, why is that so much more expensive? It it basically means for the a given amount of down, you've got a much warmer down. Uh, so the really high-end expensive bags that pack down to, you know, the size of a large grapefruit, basically, um, they, that's a big grapefruit. It, it's that's a big grapefruit, <laughs> uh, but it's 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 something that you know it's if you're looking for the lightest weight and the warmest, you go for the eight fifty gram or the eight fifty loft bags. If your budget doesn't quite stretch that far, the seven fifty loft, and then you've got the six fifty loft, which again is cheaper as well. Uh, d- cheaper and not as warm. Not as warm. So yeah, it, you know the value for money is there, but you are going to have to pay for it. Now, one of the things that Cedar Summit has done this year is made some upgrades to their existing uh, quilt range and bag range to basically allow the integration of their bags and their quilts. 
We saw this last year at the outdoor retailer show where they had some bags which they were proposing for use by the military. Uh, and this layering system was um, was the first time we'd seen the layering system that they're talking about now, but it was specifically for military use, whereas this year they've bought it into the recreational market. And the aim is that just with a few adjustments and a few changes and a few ad- additional press studs, you can add a quilt to an existing sleeping bag or another quilt and double it up. So it's like adding a, a blanket, a second blanket on top of your bed at home that that additional layering increases the warmth. It gives you a bit bit more versatility as well. And that's that's the thing with it is it's really about layering your sleep system. So rather than having a sleeping bag that will keep you toasty warm in minus 10 degrees Celsius, it's not going to be particularly helpful in the middle of summer when it's 30 degrees at night time. You know, it's not going to be useful at all. But the idea of getting a, a lightweight quilt that keeps you warm in sort of 10 to 15 degrees temperature that you can add on to a sleeping bag that might be a, you know, a two or a one or two or a zero degree sleeping bag to carry you through the really cold conditions in wintertime. So it provides a degree of versatility and it provides a new way of thinking about how you can sleep at night time. Uh, now, again, if you're traveling fast and light, you may go for the most expensive sleeping bag you can get. Um, but if, if the temperatures vary dramatically, um, it, it makes it a bit hard to get a good night's sleep. Sometimes you need to have something that's going to keep you warm when it's freezing, but also not roast you when, it's, uh, when it is hot. Uh, and we recently had a car camping trip where my minus four degree sleeping bag, I was way too hot and I was having my leg and my arm out just because it was too hot because the temperature didn't get as cold as I expected. Yeah, I wasn't. (laughs) (laughs) So the new quilts that they've got on the market now, um, they've got the, they've upgraded the Ember range, which is their 850 down range. They've now got the new Cinder range, which is a 750 down range. The material or the fabric that forms the inner and outer shell is a bit thicker, a bit more durable, uh, and as a 750 loft quilt is going to be a bit cheaper. Um, and then they've also got uh, a new glow range, which is a synthetic quilt. Now, synthetic bags traditionally have been used by outdoor um organizations that take you camping and hiking, uh, schools, because they're, they tend to be a much more durable sort of product. They don't tend to pack down as small as um, the down bags or the down quilts do. But the, the advantage they do have is if a synthetic quilt gets wet, it's still going to keep you warm. So if you're in conditions where there's a chance your sleep system is going to get wet, that's where the synthetic range tends to come in. So in Europe, as an example, much more common than it is here in Australia where we expect most of our nights or most of our camping to be dry. So Cedar Summit, as I said, most of their their range is focused or the new range in the coming year is focused on their sleep system the quilts, the sleeping bag adjustments uh, and the sleeping mats are all new product that should be on the market by sort of approximately March next year. So keep an eye out for those. We talked to um, Ryan about where the industry was heading or what the impact of the industry today uh, was due to the coronavirus and the fires and probably the takeaway from this, and this is something that we all need to think about, is uh, a lot of stores have, have been closed or have had reduced hours or people have not gone into them. And I went into a, a large shopping centre today uh, to pick up a new Wi-Fi modem and I've never seen this large shopping centre as empty as it was. It, it just amazed me. So I think a lot of retail stores are struggling. Uh, so buying local uh, or buying from an Australian store as, tr- as opposed to buying online from overseas. Um, I think you know, if we can, if we are in the market, we have the ability that we are buying new gear, think about supporting your local stores. Yeah, I think that's important. I think also get get to know what's happening in your uh, local market. Um, 
one of the things you were saying today, Tim, was that the a lot of the stores were opening uh, much later in the morning. So, you know, it was 11 o'clock uh, opening time. So get to know what they're doing. Don't think that they're closed or don't think that they're not interested. They're just trying to, um, I, I guess, provide the service um, and minimise the cost by not being open the, the length of times because people are not visiting to the extent that they used to be. Um, but if we visit, then they will. They'll, you know, extend their opening hours and, uh, you know, at some point things might go back to normal. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what normal is anymore. Um, but we definitely need to support them to help them do that. That's all for this week's episode. We hope you enjoyed our two interviews. Uh, next week we have three possibly four interviews to come your way. Um, And again, talking about some new product that's coming through uh, and some interesting things that's happening in the outdoor industry uh, over the next sort of six to eight months. So keep an eye out for that. We hope you've enjoyed this week's episode. That's all for me. Bye for now. And bye from me. Sometimes you do need to have something that is going to keep you cold when it's freezing um, or warm when it's freezing. (laughs) Sorry.